Let's bow our heads before the Lord. We truly do pray, Father, that by your Holy Spirit you will, in these next moments, speak to us and help us to find great joy in you, great peace. Help us, Lord, to understand that your forgiveness is real forgiveness. Your compassion is genuine compassion. Your restoration is total restoration. Help us, Lord, to examine our own hearts and to come to you. And I pray you'll bless us now. In the name of Jesus, amen. Everyone sins. Unbelievers, new believers, seasoned saints. We all struggle with temptation and sin. We read in the Bible that David sinned with Bathsheba, and after a year or so, he was confronted by Nathan, the prophet. And as a result of that, he opened his heart back up to God and he repented. Very shortly after that, he penned the words of Psalm 51, and then later the words of Psalm 32 to record his repentance and his new viewpoint on sin and its effect on believers. We learn from these two psalms that true repentance is the product of a submissive heart. And I would suggest to you that these two psalms compromise the greatest picture in all of the Word of God of what it means to truly be repentant of sin. And so I would like to speak to you about Psalm 32, but first I'd like to read uh, Psalm 51. And uh, I'd like for you to read it with me right off the screen. Let's read together. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, Blot out my transgressions, wash away all my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned, and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are proved right when you speak, and justified when you judge." Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Surely you desire truth in the inner parts. You teach me wisdom in the inmost place. Cleanse me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will turn back to you. Save me from blood guilt, O God, the God who saves me, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O God, you will not despise. Those are words that can only be penned by a person who has come back to God and 
is truly right with him. I find that repentance is a major theme in Scripture. Here are a few verses that talk about it. Isaiah 55, 7. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return to the Lord and he will have compassion on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. Mark chapter 2, verse 17. And hearing this, Jesus said to them, It is not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Also Luke 15, verse 7. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. And then 2 Peter 3, 9, which we probably all know, the Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. What is repentance? It would be a good thing for us to get a definition of that. Well, repentance is a change of mind leading to a change of behavior. Repentance is not simply saying, oh, I'm sorry, or, well, I've learned my lesson now, or, please forgive me, or even, well, I know it was wrong. In fact, repentance is not even just a change of behavior. Repentance is a change in the way that we think that causes a change in the way we behave. It's not just admitting what we have done. I heard a man say once that he could live like whatever he wanted to and sin all he wanted to. All he had to do was go to the Lord and confess it, and he was back off the hook, ready for another week. That kind of attitude is found nowhere in the Bible. Repentance is a humble heart. It's a submission to a holy God. Well, we were mentioning David's story a minute ago, and let's just uh, review that a little bit in our minds. Um, in chapter 11, you have sin covered up. Uh, chapter 11 of 2 Samuel records David's sin with Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Uriah was not even a Jew, but he was fighting in Israel's army, fighting in David's army. He had living quarters there in Jerusalem near David's palace. Uriah was away at war fighting for King David. David should have been there too. But instead, David stayed at home in his palace. And after lusting after her, David sinned with Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. And Bathsheba became pregnant. David tried his best to cover up his sin by bringing Uriah home, hoping he would go to his wife and have relations with her. And then nobody would know. But nothing David tried would persuade Uriah to go home and be with his wife. And so David sent him back to Joab, the commander of the army, who was still fighting, and he had a note with him. Be sure that Uriah is in the thick of the battle and he gets killed. This was done... And David thought that his sin was all now nicely covered up and would not be found out. After her time of mourning, Bathsheba and David were married. And no one would really need to suspect that the baby she was carrying was not Uriah's baby. 
David kept silent about his sin. It was covered up for about a year. But that was a miserable year for David. His fellowship with God was broken. He was still in a desperate effort to keep his sins hidden, but it was eating him up on the inside. He no longer could enjoy the presence of the Lord, no longer put his heart into writing psalms. He had dried up spiritually on the inside. He must have longed for the good old days. It must have been very depressing living a lie. David was spiritually defiled and he knew it. He could no longer seek the presence of the Lord. I'm sure many times David said, if I could only go back and not do some things I had done. If I'd have only just gone to war instead of staying home. But what was done was done, and David wept. His sin was covered up, but that's not what he needed. What he needed was forgiveness and cleansing and restoration, for he missed his relationship with God. That brought him to the end of a year where sin was confronted. And that's recorded in 2 Samuel 12. Sometime after the birth of the baby, God sent Nathan the prophet to confront David about his sin of adultery and the murder of Uriah the Hittite. And at that time, God used Nathan the prophet to get through to David, and David broke. He confessed his sin, and he stopped covering it up. In fact, he penned a song to be sung in the worship services at the temple, at the tabernacle, excuse me, where he confesses his sin, and he wants the entire congregation to sing it. No longer hiding it, he felt free, and he wanted people to learn from his experience. He asked God in that psalm for forgiveness and to create in him a pure heart. Now, it was likely not very long after that, but sometime, that David reflected on that sin, and he penned the words of Psalm 32, which is in our reading calendar for today. He started out with words of relief and rejoicing. The first two verses are really about the joy of forgiveness. But in order to, co to come to that joy, David reviewed his sins. The first one that he mentions of his four sins was transgression. That's a Hebrew word that means to pass over a boundary, to do something that is forgiven, forbidden. You have crossed the line. And David had indeed crossed a forbidden boundary when he had taken another man's wife and had even taken that man's life. The second sin that David speaks about is just the word sin. And interestingly, um, uh, the Hebrew word for sin is pretty much equivalent to the Greek word in, in the New Testament, hamartia, um, which means to miss the mark, uh, not, uh, uh, not doing what God has commanded us. Romans 3.23 boldly states, that all of us have sinned, we have missed the mark, and not only that, we continue to fall short of the glory of God. David knew good and well he had missed the mark of God's required morality of him. And he knew good and well he had missed the mark in protecting people 
by deliberately having a man murdered just to keep from being confronted by him. The third sin that he mentions is iniquity, and it means what is perverse or what is unjust. Interestingly, the word, the Hebrew word is uh, Avon, not to be confused with Avondale, the place of sin. No, this is not the place of sin. But the word Avon is uh, the uh, Hebrew word there. Uh, by the way, the word Avon also means in English river. So we're going to go with that reading. And although Avondale does not have a river, it has a little creek. Nevertheless, uh, this word signifies what is perverse or distorted and uh, turned out of its proper course or situation. Anything that's morally distorted or perverted, such as the adultery he had been involved in, or things which are contrary to justice, such as his treatment of Uriah the Hittite. And I, I, what bothered David, no doubt, was that he knew that both of those sins were on his record with God, and that they both carried the death penalty. The fourth word that he mentioned is deceit. It's a Hebrew word that means fraud, or deceit, or guile. David had committed this sin as well when he tried to, his best to cover up his adultery with Bathsheba, and then in wicked desperation had her husband killed so David would not have to face him. But in these first couple of verses, the tone is not one of condemnation, but it's one of joy, the joy of forgiveness from all of these sins. And we learn something from that, that it doesn't matter what your sin is. It can be forgiven, and it can bring, you can have the joy of your salvation restored to you. And so David dealt with each one of these. He said that his transgressions were forgiven. It's interesting that the word forgiveness, this word forgiveness means to, for our sins to be borne away by a substitute sacrifice. It's an interesting word. It means to take your sin away. And I have in mind that on the Day of Atonement, there was a uh, one of two goats, and, and the one goat, the a high priest would put his hands upon the head of that goat, and he would confess the sins of Israel of the past year, no doubt categorically rather than individually. And symbolically, God transferred the guilt of Israel through that high priest onto that animal, and everyone understood that that animal now bore the sins that they had committed. And then a man was appointed to take that goat with a rope around its neck, lead it through the streets of the encampment of those tents of Israel and lead it way out into the wilderness, way to a place where it would never be able to come back no doubt would be killed by some wild animal. And that imagery is this imagery of forgiveness. My sins have been borne away by a substitute sacrifice. There were two goats on that day, and the other goat fulfilled the rest of that definition. For that second goat was slain, and its blood taken into the Holy of Holies and sprinkled seven times on and before the Ark of the Covenant, signifying that our transgression is forgiven. It is born away from us. To carry around guilt is a terrible thing. Every one of us need to know that our sin has been born away from us. 
that it is no longer identified and associated with us, that it is removed from me as far as the east is from the west or up is from down. That God removes that sin. Nathan the prophet announced it to David in 2 Samuel chapter 12. Your sin has been taken away from you. I think to carry around the guilt, thinking that that God has not forgiven you, is truly a burdensome thing. And to think that God cannot forgive you is worse. To think that you have crossed a line and that God has has now turned his back on you and that he hates you and that he will never forgive you for a terrible sin. I've known people that feel that way. You don't need to be there. 1 John 1.9 talks about the faithfulness of God in forgiveness. When he says this, if we confess, which means to agree with God, it doesn't mean to admit, it means to agree with God. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin. And not only that, he goes way beyond just the forgiveness. He cleanses us from all unrighteousness. He cleans us up. You could summarize that verse by just saying that when we come to a place, when we think the same way about our sin as God thinks, then God forgives us of that sin and he goes beyond it, beyond forgiveness. He cleanses our life from unrighteousness. He removes it because of our attitude of thinking as he thinks. To know that you are forgiven is a priceless, burden-lifting realization. Don't ever think that you are somehow in a category of sinners that God will not forgive. That is not true. Writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the Apostle Paul said that he was the chief of sinners. Now, I guess that means that I have to fall in rank somewhere behind or underneath him, don't you think? If he's the chief of sinners, then I guess every one of us are less than that. And I guess if he could be forgiven... I can be as well. That's why he wrote this. In, second, in 1 Timothy 1, 15 and 16, he said, It is a trustworthy statement and deserving full acceptance. This is a trustworthy statement and it deserves your full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. Yet, for this very reason, I found mercy, so that in me, the foremost of sinners, Jesus Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example of, for those who would believe in him for eternal life. What is he saying? God saved the worst one so everybody else would know you can be saved as well. Paul's argument is this. Christ came to save sinners. And so he picked me, the worst sinner of all, and saved me. Now the reason he saved me is so that everyone else in the world will know he can save you too. Letter B, David's sin was covered. His sin was covered. So he says, blessed is the man whose transgression is forgiven and whose sin is covered. Sin has to be put out of sight. It is odious and abominable and must be put out of sight. It must be blotted out made invisible to God. Thus, God does not see the sin when he sees you. You and I may feel guilt for sin, but when God forgives sin, he covers it, and it is no longer visible to him. He no longer sees that sin when he sees you. 
He covers it up. My sin is no longer in the thoughts of God or his vision of me because he has blotted it out. In the old uh, ancient days when they were writing on animal skins, it was so hard to obtain an animal skin that if you made a mistake and you're writing on it, you really didn't want to throw it away. And they devised a chemical that they could use which blotted it out. And when they put that chemical on that writing, the ink disappeared. And that is the imagery that is here. God makes the record of your sin disappear. He blots it out. It's covered up. It's gone. The third thing he mentions, David's iniquity was removed. In verse 2, Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity. What does that mean? It means that God removes sin from our record. Imputation is that which God records on an account. And so what happens is that even though you have sinned, God removes that from your record. It's not there anymore. Your record is expunged so that it's not there anymore. Isn't that great? The Apostle Paul quotes verses 1 and 2 of this um, in Romans chapter 4 when he is arguing that our justification is based upon the imputation of Christ. That is, my sin has been taken off my account and placed on the account of Jesus, and the righteousness of Jesus has been placed on my account, so I have imputed righteousness. On, in a legal sense, God has put the righteousness of Jesus Christ on your account, and you'll never be bankrupt of righteousness again. That's great news. But he has taken your sin, and he has imputed it to Christ, and then Christ died, and my sin died with him. Are you glad for that? You are? Somebody say amen. Oh, thank you. God removes it from my record. You know what? There, <clears throat> there are people who have wronged you, right? I want you just to, for a moment, think about somebody who has wronged you. They really hurt you when they did this. Everybody has somebody in mind, probably set you back. They hurt you. And when you remember that person, perhaps it's hard for you to remember that person without remembering that way they hurt you. Right? Does anybody have a situation like that? Nobody wants to vote. You're just nodding your heads. <laughs> But when God looks at you, he doesn't see your sin anymore. He has sponged it and removed it from the record, and it's not there. He has blotted it out. It's not there. You say, but it was heinous. But it's gone, just as if you had never done it. Now when he sees you, he has willed to not see your sin. In his will, yes, he's omniscient, but he has willed to remove that from you. And when he sees you, he sees you as a cleansed person. Our trouble is we have trouble forgiving ourselves. We remember them a whole lot better than God does. And he would rather 
that you not do that because he went to a great deal of expense to remove your sin from you. When God forgives us, he has removed that iniquity. What a gracious blessing that is. Letter D, David's deceit was cleansed. And in whose spirit there is no deceit or no guile. David had prayed in Psalm 51 that God would create in him a pure heart and renew a right spirit in him. And that is exactly what God did. God took away his lying lips and deceitful spirit. I know that there is no peace in a person who has to keep lying and covering up. It's always, it's always trying to keep the truth from people. During that year of unrepentance, David did not want people to know he was a murderer. He didn't want people to know he was an adulterer. He did not want people to know to what extent he had gone to cover up his sin. He had lived a lie. In the back of his mind, he knew he was a phony. Now that the sin was out, David confessed his sin. He found God's forgiveness, but he didn't want to remain a liar. Have you ever noticed that lying can become a habit? There are some people who lie who don't need to lie. They just lie because it's a habit. They just don't tell the truth. It's a habit. It's a terrible way to live one's life. David prayed, God, I want you to renew the sensitivity in my heart to telling the truth. I want you to renew my spirit inside me so that I, I don't continue to live as a deceitful person. And God did that for him. God renewed his spirit. How blessed, he says. How happy. How well-adjusted is the man who finally comes clean with God, who genuinely repents. And David now no longer lived a lie. In fact, he turned his sin even into a congregational song. I don't have to lie and hide it anymore. In fact, I want people to learn from my sin. The pain of unrepentance. When I kept silent, my bones grew old through my groaning all the day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into the drought of summer. David now, after he had rejoiced in forgiveness, he, he now wants to go back for the sake of the singer of the song to reflect on how awful it was to live under those conditions. When I was trying to hide it, keeping silent about my sin, it was eating me up. My, bro my bones grew old. God chastens the unrepentant. He brings us trouble and anguish. He gives us physical troubles and problems. And as we know, as, as David knew, this was the hand of God upon him. Verse 4 says, your hand was upon me. That's why my bones seemed to grow old within me. That's why my vitality was gone. Your hand was heavy upon me. David was physically weakened and he was grieved inwardly. God was dealing severely with David in that year. And yet David held out a long time before getting honest with God. I've thought about that. And, and I wonder if, if it was that he, prob he probably thought that the consequences of becoming honest would be too great for him to bear. He knew the law required the death penalty for his sin of adultery and his sin of murder. And then, there, of course, was the embarrassment of the whole nation finding out. It probably seemed better to David to just keep the whole thing hidden. 
but God wouldn't let him do that. Hebrews 12 says this, Have you forgotten the encouraging word which God speaks to you as his children? My child, pay attention when the Lord corrects you and do not be discouraged when he rebukes you because the Lord corrects everyone he loves and he punishes everyone he accepts as a child. Endure what you suffer as being a father's punishment. Your suffering shows that God is treating you as his children. Was there ever a child who was not punished by his father? If you are not punished by God, then, as all of his children are, then it means you're not his real child at all, but you're an illegitimate child. You don't really belong to him. What's he saying? He's saying God doesn't discipline the devil's kids. Only God's children have his discipline. And so if you're living in sin and not feeling the hand of God upon you, you better examine your heart and find out if you really are a child of God. Verse 9 of Hebrews chapter 12 says, in the case of our human fathers, they punished us and we respected them. Well, how much more then should we submit to our spiritual father and live? I want you to notice it is submission to the father, which is a key element of true repentance. When we are punished, it seems to us at the time something to make us sad and not glad. But later on, however, those who have been disciplined by such punishment reap the peaceful reward of a righteous life. I have a part of a little poem. I don't like the whole poem, but I like part of this one poem. The Hound of Heaven by uh, Francis Thompson. He lived from 1859 to 1907. But he writes a lot like Shakespeare. He writes these words. I fled him down the nights and down the days. I fled him. Down the arches of the years, I fled him. Down the labyrinthy ways of my mind, and in the midst of tears, I hid from him. And under running laughter, up vistaged hopes I sped, and shot precipitated adown titanic glooms of chasm fears from those strong feet that followed, followed after, but with unhurrying chase and unperturbed pace, deliberate speed, majestic instancy, they beat, and a voice beat, more instant than the feet. All things betray thee who betrayest me, I pleaded, outlaw wise, by many a hearted casement, curtained red, trellised with intertwining charities. For though I knew his love who followed, yet I was sore adread, lest having him I must have not beside. Too many people are running from God because they're afraid that if they really come clean, maybe he'll take things away from them that they don't want him to take. Many people run from God who if they just stopped running and turned around would find his love and his restoration. Until then, the hound of heaven pursues you with trouble and disappointment with loss and fear until you stop running and you turn around and you face him and you repent. Number three, the nature of true repentance. Chapter 32 
or rather Psalm 32, verse 5, I acknowledge my sin to you, and my iniquity I have not hidden. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the iniquity of my sin. One day, David got honest with God, and he acknowledged his sin. He made a decision to confess his sin to the Lord, and his, to his great relief, God forgave his iniquity. I acknowledged my sin. I accurately assessed it. I looked at it for what it was. I've stopped whitewashing it, and I let myself become fully aware of the awfulness of it. When this confession was made thoroughly and sincerely, I ceased to cover and extenuate my offense. And then you, Lord, forgave the iniquity of my sin. I felt the hardness of my heart. I felt the deep distress of my soul. But I also felt the power to confess and the power to abhor my sin. I also felt confidence in the mercy of the Lord. And I felt the forgiveness of the iniquity of my sin. Number four, David then expresses a new freedom to pray. Verse six says, For this cause everyone who is godly shall pray to you in a time when you may be found. Surely, in a flood of great waters, they shall not come near him. You are my hiding place. You shall preserve me from trouble. You shall surround me with songs of deliverance. What is this new development in the psalm? David says, for this cause, for this reason. That is, David's restoration. David's no longer needing to be pursued by the hound of heaven. He's no longer needing to feel the pressure of God upon him. And all of the troubles that he knew were the hand of God upon him. And he is saying, I, I, I'm past that now. And so for this cause, not just me, but anyone who is godly, that is, who has forsaken their sin, who has confessed it and been forgiven, shall pray to you in a time when you may be found. And if it's a flood of great waters, we know you will protect us because you no longer have to discipline. Oh God, now you are my hiding place. I no longer have to hide from you. You are my hiding place. You shall preserve me from trouble. You will surround me with songs of deliverance. Instead of God being David's adversary, God has become David's hiding place, his shelter, his refuge. Number five, David found a new ministry. Now, many people have thought that verse eight is God speaking. But since, but since it's associated with Psalm 51, I'm going to take it, this verse, the same way that verse eight presents the same idea. It's David speaking when he says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way that you should go, and I will guide you with my eye, because I've got the eye of experience. David counseled others not to refuse to submit to the Lord, but to make a willing confession. Look at what he says in verse 9. Do not be like the horse or like the mule. He could have added, that's the way I was. I was stubborn and refused to come to the Lord, which have no understanding, which must be harnessed with a bit and bridle, else they will never come near you. 
What is he saying? He's saying God knows how to put the pressure on, and if you don't come to him, he's going to come to you. And he's going to put the pressure on and bring you back. Stop running. Turn around. Confess your sin. If you persist in your reluctance to come back to God and repent of your sin, then God has to bring you in by force. And that's not going to be pretty. He concludes this. Psalm Verses 10 and 11. Many sorrows shall be to the wicked, but he who trusts in the Lord, mercy shall surround him. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. David is ending this psalm with this observation. Many sorrows shall be to the wicked person. I know, says David, I was there. But when you confess your sin and trust in the Lord, you will find that God's loyal, faithful love, his chesed, will bring you forgiveness. And he'll give you back your gladness. He will restore the joy of your salvation. He will bring you back and you will know You've been declared righteous, and you can shout for joy. In a word, you can once again enjoy the presence of a holy God. You can once again cry with the seraphim of Isaiah 6. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Holy is his name. Holy, holy, holy God. I love you. How majestic is your name back in fellowship with God. What a beautiful picture. In the presence of your infinite mind, I'm so small and frail and weak when I see
and I am changed in the presence of a holy God. <clears throat> you are holy. An old hymn reads this way, Just as I am, and waiting not to rid my soul of one dark blot, to thee whose blood can cleanse each spot, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. Just I am, though tossed about with many a conflict and many a doubt, Fightings within and fears without, O Lamb of God, I come. God is asking us to humble ourselves and submit to a holy God and find the great in, immeasurable joy that he wants to give to us who have been cleansed by the blood of Jesus who walk honestly before him and are ready for his presence. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful that you have sought us sinners to be in relation with you. And yet we all would acknowledge that it takes spiritual maintenance in our lives. For this world is such a dirty place, it's hard for us to not be contaminated by this world. We do not whitewash sin. We seek forgiveness. We do not deny it, but freely admit we are sinners by birth and sinners by choice and sinners by habit. But come to you and ask for your forgiveness and your restoration. If there's one here today, Lord, that needs to come clean with you, I pray that today will be that day. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And for his glory eternally, amen. Let's stand. Go into the world forgiven and in fellowship with God. Have courage 
hold on to the things that are good. And walk with God this week in the power of the Holy Spirit. And may God's grace be with us all. Amen. We're dismissed.